know in the chat box below, just so we can double check and make sure the audio is working. For some reason, the connection keeps giving us some errors, uh, but we're going to try that out. I'm coming to you here from my home sewing studio in North Central Florida. It's a very hot and muggy day. Looks like we're good. Hi, everybody. Let's see. Hi, Margie, tuning in. Hi, Miss Kathy. Hi, Kalisha. All right, we got Mary Grace tuning in as well. Sally, listening from your car in a parking lot, girl. I hope you're okay, good. Thanks for tuning in. She says she likes to listen to it in her car because she hates to miss it. Great. Hi, Tammy. She says, I can see you and hear you. Awesome. So today for Whip Wednesday, this I believe is Whip Wednesday episode number 30. And there's a fly in here, clearly. Um, I wanted to talk all about handbag straps, shoulder straps, handles, and that kind of stuff. Because if you recall, if you tuned in last Friday, I went live for like my little flash sale Fridays and we opened the virtual doors to my seventh edition bag club. And that's what we're the 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 signups are still open right now. We are going to close the club up this Friday, May 7th at 11.59 p.m. Eastern time. So I know a ton of you have gotten in already, so you should be able to just log into your account, start getting your supply checklists printed out so you can start choosing fabrics for each of the bags and all that stuff is already there. Link to your bag club account. If you haven't yet joined, you got two days left. Then when we close it up, nobody else will be able to join. But those of you that get in before we close it, will be able to access all the course content, all the live chats and our Zoom sessions will be recorded. And if you get in before we close it, you'll have access to all that stuff laid out as your calendar schedule in the club is, and then indefinitely afterwards. Okay. So if you want to get in, this is the time. The link is in the description box and we're going to go ahead and put it in the chat as well. Linda says I'm in for bag club number seven. I saw a bunch of you today in my bag club group on Facebook mentioned that this was your seventh bag club. You have signed up for every single one that I've been doing over the years, which is awesome. 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 All right. Jamie says she signed up as well. Mary Grace says, yippee, a bag club. And so what I wanted to do was share some tips. We're going to do kind of a little experiment here using three different interfacings. We're going to talk about webbing, cork fabric, leather. I'm going to give you some tips, things that you might want to um, consider getting if you're going to be sewing and then depending on what sewing machine you use, all that kind of stuff. So let's go ahead and shoot over to this over the shoulder camera and then we'll put my face in a bubble. So this is going to be the first bag that we tackle in my seventh edition bag club. This is the Hoya drawstring bag and you can see it has a drawstring opening here. I just got some yarn in there, but it closes up with the cinched up drawstring, but you can see that this also extends up. So use your imagination. There's a ton of different uses for a bag like this gym bag, dance class, uh, swim class, right? things where you might need uh, to swap out bulkier shoes or something for your flats. If you commute, um, lunch, you can put big water bottles and stuff here. And then once you use the stuff, you can, you know, if you had paper or plastic, whatever, you can get rid of that. And then it condenses back down. So the shoulder straps on this are just made out of fabric. So this is always probably your most straightforward option if you have a lot of fabric in your stash. Okay. So that's one. And I wanted to talk about straps today because the five bags that we're going to be tackling in my seventh edition bag club, um, which again closes on Friday at midnight, they all have different straps and handles. So that's one. I'm going to go through them real quick. I'm not going to talk too much about the bags because I've already done that, but I just want to show you so we can focus a little bit more on just the um, straps on them so you can see how they're all different. So that's one. Two is this one, and this just features simple webbing with an adjustable strap, okay? So that's two, three is the Vega project bag. I'm working on a, <laughs> on a little cardigan there, but you can see that this strap, oftentimes you see this shape um, made out of like cork vinyl and stuff like that, but you can also make it out of fabric. So of course, if you get in the bag club, I'll be teaching y'all how to do all of this. Okay. So super cute little handles, not super long ones, um, not bulky ones, but just something cute that you can grab like that. That's three, um, four is this one. This also is made out of fabric, but it's interfaced. And then when we get to the video lesson on this in the back club, we'll talk a little bit about the importance of cutting fabric on the bias. I believe I got a couple comments last week. Someone was asking me, was the binding or the straps on here cut on the bias? Part of it is, part of it isn't. I recommend that you cut all of it on the bias. And you can see that I just use a solid fabric here to create both the binding of this top edge of the handbag that then goes into one continuous um, connection here for the shoulder straps. So 
Super cool techniques, a lot of different skills that we're gonna be learning in the bag club. That's four, and then five is gonna be probably one of the easiest constructions for uh, shoulder straps. They're added on at the end after you're done with the bag. This is my Bosco bag, it has a mesh pocket. You could also do clear vinyl. And these are actual leather straps that are just stitched on. So we do sew them through all the layers pretty simply, okay? So we'll talk a little bit about this and what I recommend. I did sew these straps on on my Juki 2010Q. So it's a semi-industrial sewing machine, but you don't need to have like a super heavy duty industrial machine. I would recommend that you use like a 9014 needle and I'm gonna grab the pack that I like to use for my bags. Here it is. Let me grab a sip. These are Schmetz Universal Needles, and they're the chrome ones in the size 9014. So the thicker the layers you're going to be going through, especially leather, pleather, vinyl, stuff like that, you want to bump up the size. So 8012 is our typical universal, you know, run of the mill if we're just sewing fabrics and some light interfacings together. That's usually what we use, or at least that's usually what I use. But 9014 is going to allow me to get not just through this leather, but also to sew through the leather through to the fabric layers that are included. So something you're gonna to wanna to keep in mind is like if you use a fusible fleece or a foam interfacing, you wanna account for all the layers together if you're doing something like this where you're just attaching the strap at the end. But very important, and I know this can be tricky to source, if you did wanna get your hand on leather straps, absolutely make sure, one, that it's not super thick, especially if you don't have an industrial machine, but do you see how pliable this is? And I have some options here because this can be super tricky. For my bag club members, I am trying to source right now that type of a leather. And I have some samples here that it's kind of like experimental. I've purchased them in the past and you really don't know until you get it and then you're like, no. <laughs> this is not gonna work, it's not gonna be comfy and I'm not gonna be able to sew through it easily. So here's some leather in this tan color. And the first thing that I want you to know is look how the, the, the strap stays. Okay, compare that to, this is the leather that I used on that bag. Do you see this? What a difference, how that stuff just stays like hard curved. It's not really, I mean, it, it's pliable, but it's stiff and it's hard. So if this is something that you're going to have like right over your shoulder and you're wearing a sleeveless shirt, this is not gonna be comfortable. But something like this would. You see how these are more fluid? They're more fabric-like. This is what you wanna try and find. And now, one tip that might come in handy for some of you that like to shop at like thrift stores and estate sales, is that you can always take a nice worn leather handle or strap from an older bag. Oftentimes you can find real leather bags at like a yard sale or estate sale or even a thrift store for a couple dollars. Even if you don't use the whole bag itself, the straps and the hardware are worth more than that. So keep that in mind. You might even have some old bags in your in your closet that you've bought before, but you see how this doesn't like, it just is pliable enough to hold its shape no matter how I do it. These ones on the other hand, it just, <laughs> they would be okay to do like, say like a little handle like that on the side of a little dot bag or a zip pouch, you know, so that it's not really gonna be going over much of my body because it's it's, it's rough, it's hard, and, and these, the descriptions could be super similar if you're looking at a listing online. So just be mindful of that and know that yes, it is expensive. You either wanna call, see if they have a video um, from wherever you're trying to source this stuff out, but again, stay away from leather that's like this and look for something that's like that. Now, we have some webbing here that I wanna talk about because there's so many different types of webbing on the market now. These are probably the two most common and this one is gonna be way more common. This is a nylon webbing, polypropylene. It has the sheen to it, it's a synthetic. It comes in a gajillion different colors and the colors don't fade, so that's an option, okay? And then this is 100% cotton webbing and you can see, even though they're different colors, I think, that they are, like this has more sheen to it and this is a more matte look. So depending on the vibe and the whole look that you're going for for your finished bag, you wanna keep that in mind as well, okay? This is not as shiny obviously because it's cotton and another thing is sometimes you're not able to find 100% cotton webbing and it'll just say like cotton acrylic, uh, cotton poly and it'll be a blend but if it has the cotton in it, it's gonna look more matte of a finish like like this black one versus this shinier gray one okay so keep those things in mind let's see 
Let's see. Phyllis says, when you use cork, do you use a 9014 needle? So I'm going to be honest with you, Phyllis. Most of the time, I just use an 8012, but that depends a lot with um, what I'm sewing the cork to, right? And how many layers of it. So if I'm folding a chunk of cork in like four different, like four folds, right? Say something like this, pretend, and you're sewing that much, yes, I would bump up to a 9014. However, if I'm sewing a little strip, and this is a singular strip of cork, to the black webbing, then no. You know, even though I'm using the black webbing, I can still usually get away with, especially depending on the machine that you're using, with the uh, 8012 uh, needle. Okay, but when in doubt and you're kind of a little bit eh, nervous about the layers, go up to a 9014. So let me show you how I did this because this is an awesome option. We all know cork can be super pricey. I get my cork from my friend Sarah at SoSweetness.com. They have like a, a, a million different colors. And we oftentimes, even if you don't use all the cork for a bag or a purse, maybe you use some of it for a pocket. If you have strips left over, this is a great way to kind of add a little pop of bling to a plain webbing uh, strap or handle. So let me show you real quick how I would do something like that. First off, my webbing here is one inch wide. I'm just going to do a little strap. Obviously, you would do it whatever the length your pattern calls for for the strap or handle. Okay. Make sure this. Okay. And so if I wanted to add a little accent strip like this of this kind of gold speckled cork, I would just cut it and notice that if I'm looking at it from the cork side here, I still see a little bit of the black webbing on top and bottom. And that is because the webbing is one inch, but I cut the cork to three quarters of an inch. So then I just take, we'll pretend, oh girl, look at that. I eyeballed it the exact size. Where's my little ruler? So then I'm just gonna take my ruler and measure three quarters of an inch. And we know that the cork doesn't fray, so it's perfect to literally just place it on top of your webbing, and you can do this with the cotton webbing or the polypropylene. Boom, boom. You would just do it the whole length of whatever the handle is. If there were uh, smaller straps, like, like on um, something like this, where it's not like a super long strap, you know, and we just need like a little handle for it, how cute would that look? Isn't that pretty? I think so. So then, what I would do to stick this on is use some type of a glue basting technique. You can use the white washable Elmer's glue and put some down here. Just keep in mind that if you're trying to do this to say the synthetic nylon webbing, you're not going to hit it with an iron. <laughs> okay, because you don't want to hit an iron on anything synthetic, you might melt it. So instead, you can also do just like a regular school uh, washable glue stick. And I find that with this, even if I'm using cotton here and the cork, you can get away with like a low to warmish iron on it. You don't even have to fuse a glue like this. So I just take the washable glue and I'm going to do it on or put it on the back of the cork. Not too much. You just want something to hold. And then I'm just going to place it over top and center it so that I can see a little bit of the black webbing on top and on the bottom. And because the glue stick is kind of like a drier glue, it's not like a super liquidy one, you don't even have to hit it with the iron. That right there is enough to let it hold in place. You could, if you wanted to, you know, place a couple of clips to help hold that in place. But I find that using that glue basing technique really allows me to visually see and center my strip. All right. So then, and I'm just going to sew this so that some of y'all with kind of more basic sewing machines, I know oftentimes you think, uh, maybe I won't be able to sew that on my machine. Well, I have a little entry level Juki here. And this is my Juki LB5020 sewing machine. And I want you to see one layer of cork on the webbing and I'm easily gonna be able to top stitch this in place. So let me grab my foot pedal. And I just have a black thread here. Now for me, let's talk a little bit about thread. If you're a quilter, chances are you probably have a big stash of just cotton thread. Okay, I like to use polyester thread for my bags because even if I have a bag this big, I will put like 15 pounds of weight in it. And so I need something like a synthetic polyester thread to hold all those layers together. Okay, the strength, I want the stitches to hold. I don't want one of my shoulder straps to pop off while I'm, I've, you know, added a bunch of stuff into it and take it, take it on a trip on a, uh, like as a carry on bag or something. You want it to hold together. So. I just like to use polyester thread. Now this is just a 40 weight polyester. If you're doing something like I'm gonna top stitch here, 
Remember, top stitching can always be decorative. Yes, this is a construction seam technically because we want to hold the cork to the webbing, but if you had a thicker thread, the stitches would pop and you could really use something thick like these 12 weight cotton threads. That would look super fun. Or a variegated 30 weight polyester or cotton thread, all that kind of stuff. If you have it in your stash, bag projects and especially the straps are a perfect place uh, to experiment with that stuff and use what you have on hand. All right, so I'm going to top stitch this. And remember for top stitching, I always recommend going up to like a three millimeter to 3.5 millimeter length. So I'm gonna do 3.5. And then I'm just gonna stay close to the edge of the cork fabric. I'm about an eighth of an inch in. And that glue has helped keep that strap in place so that as I'm top stitching here, the cork itself is not moving over, right? So that is really why I like that glue basting technique. Allows me to center it really well. I'm just gonna go off the edge here. Just want you to see what it looks like at the end. And now I'm gonna have a matching little strap. I'll have to make like a key fob or something out of this. This looks super cute. And then of course, like the cork is a lighter color and I'm using a black thread. So if you're doing something like that where you have high contrast between the thread and the fabric, just make sure that you try to stay as straight as possible because any bobble in your stitches will tend to stand out more because, whoops, I went off a little there, because of the high contrast, like the different colors, one light, one dark. But that looks super cute. All right. Okay. Oh, Mary Grace says she added uh, cork to her last three projects. And you can see that that's a way to add kind of like that expensive little bling pop of cork without having to use like an entire chunk because if you buy it by the yard, this stuff can get really pricey. But you see, something like that would look super cute on a bag strap, a handle, all that kind of stuff. All right, so let's see. Rosa says, I always wondered what was the difference in the weight of threads. So the lower the number in terms of weights, like if you see 12 weight, that's kind of a low number compared to a 60 weight, the lower the number, the thicker the thread. So usually if you just grab a spool of thread anywhere like at the store, it's usually gonna be either a 40 or 50 weight. That's kind of your middle run of the mill, all purpose thickness of thread. Then the number goes up from there to 60, 80 or even 100 weight. Those are super, super thin, and those typically will be polyester because a natural fiber like cotton at that um, high of a weight of thread means it's super, super thin, and it, it wouldn't even hold. Like, it'll just snap super easily. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay, awesome. Yeah, Marlene says, so sweetness cork sews like butter. It does. Sarah carries the best, like, high-quality cork. I've been getting my stuff from her for years. Okay, so that's cork, adding it to the webbing. But remember, you can also um, leave the webbing just as it is, like I did on this bag. Okay, this is an adjustable strap and it's just plain. You could also, instead of adding cork, add a pop of fabric that you like. Maybe the lining fabric that you used inside of the bag. You can do the same thing. Obviously, you can't leave the raw edges raw on a cotton fabric, so you would just turn those edges under, use that same glue basting technique, make sure that when it's turned under, it fits, it's like a little bit um, narrower than the width of your webbing, and boom, a super quick accent that you can add to any webbing, you know, using fabrics from your stash without having to toss them out. All right, so let me show you something else because I have that polypropylene webbing here and you're gonna find webbing and straps and stuff in a ton of different widths. Here I have some of that polypropylene webbing in a half inch width. This one was one inch wide. So when you might wanna consider the thickness, right? Like if you have a big bag, this little strap, although it may hold it, it's just proportionally, it doesn't look right, right? So I wanted to show you an example of a bag that I have that I do use that uh, half inch wide webbing. And this is my stroll cross body bag and I have three of them here. So <laughs> I just tied up all their, um, their straps. But check out the size of the bag small, quilted or made in wax canvas. And this is one of the uh, online courses that I teach in um, on our website. This was uh, part of the 2019 bag club that's no longer available. Just like this bag club, af after Friday at midnight, it's gonna close up just like the 2019 one did. But you can still sign up for the class individually by itself. It's fully lined, but you see how small it is. It has the hardware 
and with the lobster clasps, the half inch wide um, nylon webbing just clips onto the side. Okay, so this is an example of a size of a bag that proportionally does work and looks good with the half inch wide. So think about that. You know, when you're making some small projects, if you have half inch wide webbing, you can use that. But I would not, I mean, look how thin it is. You don't want to do it like on a huge backpack and then have this little webbing. It's, it's not that it's not going to hold up. Like it's strong. It just don't look right. Especially if you have a lot of weight, the narrower the band, you know, like the narrower the strap, it's going to cut into your skin because it's not as wide as some of the thicker ones. Okay. So those are a couple options. Let me twist this up. <laughs> Carla says, girl, you're killing me with your strap stock. Girl, I got all the straps. Because when I'm designing bags, I need to be able to like play with different options. You know, you can't just say like, well, I like the size of this bag and now all I have is half inch wide. It ain't going to work. But that is that. Now let's grab some cotton because I know a lot of us have fabric in our stash. And if you're in my bag club, if you've signed up already, chances are you're going to be making a lot of fabric handles this go around. Okay. So that you can be, you know, using up fabric from your stash where you can have some basic webbing, but let's talk fabric. So I have three different samples here. It's all the same fabric. It's just designer quality quilting cotton, okay? But I've matched it up with different types of interfacing. So let's start off with the thinnest one. This is a fashion fuse. This is oftentimes what bag makers will fuse to the back of uh, lining fabric in handbags, okay? So I'm gonna place it scratchy side down onto the wrong side of the fabric because we all know the scratchy side is the side that has the adhesive dots. And all these three interfacings I'm putting here are all uh, fusible, okay? So I'm just gonna fuse this. This one likes to fuse with a little bit of water, so I'm going to hit it with some steam. Uh, Mudcat1256 is asking, on the supply lists, you have craft zippers. Do you recommend metal or nylon zippers? And, and that person is asking about the new bag club. I have craft zippers in there. I do recommend plastic for these. You could use metal if you know, you know how to handle metal and how to have some... Um, if you need to cut off on the ends. The longer 14 inch or longer zippers, I'm trying to think there's two bags that use two zippers each, those all are gonna get trimmed just barely off to the end. So if you have metal ones that you kind of like, you know, the color, maybe it matches really well and you wanna use those, my recommendation is always gonna be do it the way that I designed it first so that you know how to go through the entire project from beginning to end and then start putting your own spin on everything. Because sometimes if you can't yet envision what the next step is or how the bag is going to come together in the end and you start making changes, you may end up in a situation where you're like, oh, I had changed that and now I can't go back and finish the next step because it was supposed to be like this, if that makes sense. So I fused that one there. I'm going to set it aside, let it cool. The next one here is a light fusible batting by Bozel. And some of the bag projects in this club call for something like this too. The cool thing is that you can see how this is a little bit sheer, almost see-through. If you have any old quilt batting scraps, that will work for this as well. And that's the cool thing about this new bag club too, is that where I call for different interfacings, you don't have to buy a specific one, right? None of them feature foam, which we know is probably one of the most expensive uh, interfacings and stabilizers for bag making. It doesn't have that. Did y'all see what I just did? I almost went to hit this on here. You don't ever want to hit this fusible batting on the batting side because it's synthetic, it's a polyester. So I'm gonna flip it over to the cotton fabric side and then I'll press it from here. I run my mouth, but I usually catch myself before I make those mistakes. So again, I'm, I'm misting this. These are little spray bottles that I love. It's not like a sharp a spray of water. It's a super light mist and we have these in stock in the online shop. Any items you see me talk about and things that we carry as well as signing up for the bag club, you can always find it at craftygemini.com shop, okay? So I'm just making sure this is all fused up. We'll let that sit. And this, this uh, fusible uh, batting is only fusible on the one side. So you can see it's not like it sticks to the, to the thing or anything. So I'm going to let that cool. And then the last sample here, this is DuraFuse. It's probably one of my favorite stabilizers. It is a crisp, non-woven, fusible interface. Do you hear? It's like paper. So when you want something that's like crisp and flat, that especially when you give it a press, it just has like, that, that, that crazy crisp edge that makes you want to shake inside because it looks so perfectly crisp, DuraFuse. So again, this is again non-woven, so it's a synthetic. So I'm going to flip it to the cotton side. And I'll just double check, make sure that the shiny side, which is where the adhesive is, is touching the wrong side. 
of my fabric. And this one too, if you have the little water bottle, um, go ahead and mist it. That steam helps activate uh, the adhesives on here. Now, some of you may be wondering, why don't you just put water in here? I We live on a property that has a well and we have really hard water. I prefer to just add the water and then the heat separately. If you have a good steam iron, you can just always do it in one step. That's fine too. And I'm trying to avoid hitting this little bit here because it's the fabric wasn't quite long enough. Okay, give that a good fuse. Oh, Marjorie says, this is my first time watching you. You're so talented. Thank you for the instruction. Well, welcome. You can find me here. Different times, we're still working, finalizing our schedule for the lives. Um, and I'll keep y'all posted for sure. Okay, I'm just gonna add a little more water, make sure it's super fused. And when you do a really good job fusing your interfacings to the fabric, they become one. So I mean, you can cut it any which way and it ain't going nowhere. So that's, that's what I like. And then I always, when I'm working with a fusible, is just let it sit and cool. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, Mary says she will have to check out the spray bottle. It looks great. It's awesome. Craftygemini.com slash shop. You can find it there. Uh, Deborah's asking if I'm selling the hardware packages for the bag club. So I had an employee here this week putting the, together the kits. If you're already in the bag club, stay tuned for an email because we're going to be pre-selling those box bundles pretty, um, pretty soon. Either, either tonight or tomorrow I'll be sending out that email. Okay. All right, let's see. Uh, Deanne is asking, will the videos be posted somewhere? I work during most of the time. So I'm assuming you're talking about the bag club because there are going to be some live sessions. So if you're wondering about the bag club, the video lessons on the different bags that we are going to be tackling, there's five bags, this bag club. Uh, those video lessons are pre-recorded, they're edited, and they go live on a certain date and time. You can print out your course calendar to see when they're going to go up. And then the live sessions are scheduled live question and answer sessions where like I give you time to work on the project and then if you run into any issues or have specific questions for me, I answer those live on camera. So those are all recorded so anybody can watch them after. You know, it's really hard to, to get hundreds of people together at the same time with one time zone, right? <laughs> so I, I alternate the different times and then they're always recorded so everybody can access them at a later date. And then the live Zoom sessions will also be like that. Everything will be recorded. Okay. Um, Marley says, where did you say you get your cork from? I get them from my friend, Sarah at sosweetness.com. She has a ton of hardware supplies, cork, vinyl, and all that stuff for handbag making. So great, great, great. All right. Um, Elsa Renity says, can you apply wax to a piece of canvas? Wax, like a waxed canvas to a piece of regular canvas? Is that what you're asking? I'll see. I, I think that's what you're asking, but if you are, I don't see why not. Okay, so let's go ahead and fold these up like we would to make a strap. And now this is what you need to keep in mind. Depending on the interfacing that you're using and how many layers, whatever the pattern calls for in the handles, you'll see. This was the lightest one. This is a woven cotton fusible interfacing. And basically what it does is it turns your fabric into like, if you had two layers of the cotton fabric together. So it's still pliable, still has decent drape, but it's just like, a little bit flatter and crisper, okay? So I'm gonna fold this in half, and these are just little sample pieces, but I want you to see. And let me grab my clapper, because this guy helps me set these creases. This is invaluable when you're making straps. When you want, you know, have you ever tried to make a, a strap or a handle where you think you're folding everything perfectly in half and then in half again, and then when you go to top stitch it, one edge is like off? That clapper, this wooden tailor's clapper, and I think we're actually sold out because I just looked today on the distributor site and my distributor is sold out too. But a lot of you have been getting this from us for the past, what, year, months and stuff. So now I'm going to open it up and I'm going to take the long edge and make it reach here. But here's a mistake a lot of my students make is that they make it touch right where that center crease line is. I don't put it there. I make it come down about a sixteenth of an inch away from that fold. And then we'll do glue basting. Again, you can use the glue stick. You don't need much, okay? So I'm gonna stop a sixteenth of an inch from the center fold. And you can, I mean, I can do this super fast. But obviously, slow down if you're new to this. Same thing to the other side. And again, on this side, stop a 16th of an inch shy from the center. And what that does 
is that you avoid having this edge and this edge overlap and bulk up in that center fold. You don't want that. You want your strap to lie flat when we come into this step here and fold it right in half. Because I now don't have any fabric with interfacing times two times three because the middle is the same layer, okay? Now when I fold it, it's super flat right there where that fold line is. So if you've had issues with that in the past, use this tip and tell me how it goes next time. So I just went ahead and applied a little bit of glue there and look, I fold it in half and it is perfect. Like right here, I don't even have to pull this back or forward. It's spot on where I need it to be. And those are a couple tips right there to help you get that strap perfectly folded, creased, and the fine, look, I mean, come on. Look at that. Whew. So now you take it to your sewing machine to top stitch, right? And my glue didn't hold up in some spots because I didn't put too much, right? But if you do the liquid glue too, this is something because I know people are going to ask if it doesn't gum up your needle. So this is a liquid glue. And so I just do like dots. I don't even do like a whole big glob. All I want to do is hold this top layer of fabric to that one with the heat of the iron drying the glue. Then it sets it. So if you're wondering if it gums up your needle, no, this is not a new technique. Quilters have been using this glue and a glue basing technique, I want to say for ooh, probably over 30 years now. As long as you dry it, right? So key is don't put too much glue so you can actually dry it and it dries pretty quickly. Heat of a dry iron. If you add steam from an iron, you're gonna keep it wet because the moisture is still gonna be there, right? So dry iron, heat, and then let that glue dry. As you let it cool, go ahead, set up your sewing machine, grab it. And now when we stitch through, it's not gonna gum up anything. If you start stitching through wet glue, Yes, you probably will gum up your needle. It's not gonna damage anything. Just let it dry and peel it off. But another thing I did, if you recall, is that I put the glue in the middle. So now when I go stitch, I'm gonna stitch on the outer edges. So if for any reason there is a little bit of glue there that didn't get dried up, I'm not gonna be sewing over the glue. Make sense? So that's another reason to not add a ton of glue, okay? All right. Awesome. Lee says, I just joined the bag club. Welcome, welcome. I can't wait to see the bags y'all are going to be making. Okay. So look at this strap, how crisp it is. And remember I said that this was the version with the lightest interfacing. So you already know anything thicker than just the plain cotton fusible interfacing is going to make this even thicker because it's quadrupled. We had to fold it and fold it again. All right. So we're going to do a quick top stitch. Some people top stitch only on the edge that is open, like that you fold it up. I like to top stitch on both long edges. I find that it just, you know, it gives like a more balanced, cleaner finish. And again, because it's top stitching, I'm at about a 3.5 uh, millimeter length. And then I just stitch an eighth of an inch in from the outer edge. Try to stay as nice and straight as you can. And if you have trouble sewing straight like that, maybe you're working with a solid colored fabric and like a pop of um, a bright color of threading, you're thinking, oh no, any little mess up or bobble I make is gonna be super obvious. You can use a decorative stitch too, right? Do some zigzag stitches, something that's a little bit busier than a straight stitch, and that'll help cover up a lot too. So now I flipped it over, I'm on the other side. And if you're wondering if these straps are gonna hold up to something like leather or cork or something thicker like that or webbing, trust me, four layers of an interface cotton fabric. Look at that. So even if we had it like a handle like this that we were holding up, look at that. Beautiful, crisp, and super duper sturdy. Okay, so that's one. Let me quickly go ahead and prep the other ones just so you can see the difference. So this is the Durafuse, I can tell because it's my crisp papery interfacing. And I'm gonna try and fold these up real quick. But this is another option because I want you to see that if you have a stash of a specific interfacing, you don't necessarily have to go out and buy a whole different type of interfacing, right? If it's for something like a strap or the overall shape of the bag that, you know, you can get away with a few different types of interfacings or battings, go for it. And so in my bag club, of course, I will be recommending to you the types of interfacing that you can use. If you are already in the bag club, remember you can log into your account and print out the different supply checklists. All five of the bags that we'll be making have their own printable supply checklist so you can start preparing now. 
And at the bottom, I have a paragraph for suggestions. So in that little suggestions area, I included fabric suggestions and um, some strap suggestions on some of the bags to tell you like things that you could consider doing. You know, I had some people say um, they don't really make handbags out of cotton fabric. So they were wondering, would these bags uh, work if I use like soft vinyls or cork? Absolutely. So things like that, definitely read through those checklists. I'm cutting away the excess um, interfacing because I don't want to hit it with my iron. But look at that. Perfect. And notice the stiffer the interfacing, the less likely you are to need the glue basting because I haven't glued anything. And look how crispy it is. Perfect. So that's the DuraFuse. And then this is the light fusible batting. So let's do this one too. All right. Oh, Becky says she loves the fabric that I'm making these straps out of. Thank you. And Gloria says she bought a bolt of SF101, which is the, um, not the Bozal, the Pellon version of the, of the Fashion Fuse. She says she bought the bolt at Joann's when it was 60% off. Girl, you're going to have interfacing there to last you a lifetime. All right, so that side's done. And then this one. And remember to stop about a sixteenth of an inch shy of that center fold. Okay. Easy peasy. And that last fold, when you refold it down the center, I always give it another press just to kind of help with the fabric and, and interfacing memory, like remind itself, like, hey, this is where you were folded the first time around. Okay. Oh, this iron is toasty. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and top stitch these ones. And then we'll just fold them like I did earlier to show you like, so, so you can see if, if with your own eyes, you can tell the difference in the different interfacings. And the same way that I use the light fusible batting here, you can use a regular batting that's not fusible. Okay. Because we have it done in so many layers. Notice I haven't even glue based it on these. But if you're a beginner and you really want, or a perfectionist, and you want your stuff to be super duper crisp and folded perfectly for your straps, that glue basting really does serve like almost like a second pair of hands to help keep everything in place for you. Oh, this one feels good. It feels almost padded because it has that puffiness of the uh, fusible batting. But now notice, I'm going through all these layers on this little home sewing machine. This is the Juki LB5020. Do we have any machines left in stock? Do you know? Yeah, I think so. We do. We do have some machines left in stock. Sometimes people say they're looking for like an upgrade. Oh, man. This will make a great backpack strap. I can feel it. Super comfy. And this one is a lot crisper because it has that crisp non-woven DuraFuse interfacing. And so sometimes people think, well, it takes so long to make your own fabric straps. I mean, if you're making something that's 60 inches in length, yeah, it can take a while, but I kind of like it. It's pretty satisfying when you fold it and fold it again, and then you're like, oh, it's like a perfect little strip that you can't wait to add to your bags. These are just samples, and they're smaller, but when you're working on something that maybe just has a handle instead of a super long strap, you can see that they don't really take much time to make at all. All right. Let's see. Okay, let's see. Someone is asking, um, Rachel's asking, how much of the fusible batting and fashion fuse do we need for the bag club bags? So for the bag club, you'll need probably about two packs of the fashion fuse that measures 60 inches by 36. Um, a scrap piece of the Dura fuse is enough because there's only one bag that uses it. And then for the fusible batting, I would say um, one pack that measures 45 by 36, uh, and that will be enough for three bags. Uh, that, that use it, right? But it's say you only have one pack and you're making, you know, some bags with the, the light fusible batting and some with regular batting scraps that you have, that will work too. So you can mix and match them too. Okay, so where's the other one? Here. See, so I can tell the, the woven fusible interfacing and the DuraFuse, look-wise, they're both super crisp because the interfacing is nice and flat. But I can tell by feel that this is DuraFuse. Can you see how it's like a little bit stiffer? Watch. 
This bends a little bit easy, uh, more easily than that one, but they're both, so, oh, it's just, <laughs> there's nothing like a, a nice crisp strap, okay? And then this is the fusible batting one, which probably to y'all, I mean, it looks pretty similar, but I can feel in the middle where it's not stitched, there's like a little bit of puffiness to it because of the batting, even though it's a light fusible batting, okay? So you can see how because that batting is light, it just wants to lie flat because it's not as crisp and uh, stiff as some of the other interfacings. But on a bag, you can make the same bag and put all three of these Unless they were really, really inspecting it, nobody would know what interfacing you used. So if you have like a little scrap piece left of one interfacing or you're thinking, oh, well, the pattern calls for this I, and I, I have to go out and buy a whole new pack. Can I use maybe this other one? If it's something this close, you can totally put it, pull it off, okay? So no big deal. All right. Oh, Sally's so cute. She says uh, she has the Juki LB5020. She says she calls it her cupcake machine. <laughs> it's so sweet and light. It is but a workhorse, isn't it? So you saw me sew through all these. They've been doubled up, quadrupled up. And, um, and actually, oh yeah, I do have the 9014 chrome needle in here and then a polyester thread. And even looking at the stitches, the quality, the stitch quality looks good. You know, sometimes on some machines, when you start going through bulk, it looks like a little bit off on the tension and stuff. I don't have to adjust anything on this machine. Love it. Okay. Um, Becky says, which one was the one in the middle? I really like that one. Durafuse, girl. Look at that. It ain't going nowhere. <laughs> if you made something that had a handle that just lifted up off the top and you wanted it to just like sew down this side and leave it like that with that shape, you know, super crispy. Okay. Um, Mudcat1256 says, uh, says, I'm confused with Durafuse and Fashion Fuse. Which one is comparable to SF101? SF101 is the Pellon version of a cotton woven fusible. That is the same as Fashion Fuse. Durafuse is harder. It's stiffer. It's non-woven, so it's not cotton. And it's a crisp non-woven um, non fusible interfacing. I know. If you don't sew handbags and bags, it's you're like, I need interfacing. You walk into the store like, there's 7,000 of them. What do I pick? <laughs> but um, if you're in the bag club, no worries, because those are always questions that you can ask us in the group. I will tell you what is what. And in the video lessons, obviously, since I'm showing you visually step by step, you'll see why we're using each one for a specific step. And then on the checklist, I also gave you some suggestions down here of things that you can um, replace. And then I'll mention those in the video lessons as well as we're going through like, hey, if you only have this, you can use it in place of that in this, in this application. And the best way to learn about the interfacings is to make bags with them, right? Once you make one and you say, oh, wow, that was too stiff. It might have been too stiff for the project that you made, but you may make a different project and think, oh, I want to go with, to, with the really stiff Durafuse stuff because that would fit this application better. And so then once you build up that knowledge and expertise, that's kind of how you're able to then, you know, pick and choose from your own mind right? What you think would work best, even if it doesn't match with the designer intended. Because that's the beauty of making our own stuff. We can do whatever we want. All right. Great, great, great. Um, Jen says, what is the Pellon version of Durafuse? I'm not very familiar with a lot of the Pellon products, but I know I have used a Craft Fuse. I want to say it's a Craft Fuse 808. And that was kind of similar, um, but it's been a while since I used it, but something like that. Like if it's papery and it says crisp non-woven, that's going to be the closest thing that you can get to it. Okay. Awesome. Maureen says today's topic was so helpful and useful. Thank you again, Vanessa, for all you teach us. I'm happy to help. And I think it helps to see it in application, show you, talk about the top stitching, how you can just leave your webbing as is. You can add the accent of cork or even fabric, all that kind of stuff. Okay. So I'm going to clean up here, see if I have any last minute questions. And then remember that I will be back this Friday for another live to kick off kind of like the closing end of the bag club at 11 59 PM on Friday, my bag club is closing and it will never open again. The bags will go like the bag courses will be sold individually by themselves after we're done with the bag club. So at the, uh, that will be, I guess in July is I will release the courses individually. So if you only like one bag, you can wait to sign up then. But if you want to save money and be a part of a community, because we are going to be making the bags together, answering your question and answer sessions live one, we're doing five of those sessions, one per bag. Uh, 
and then the live Zoom sessions. So the live Zoom sessions, I mean, we'll probably answer some questions here and there, but I really want it to be like face to face so you can show your friends like, hey, look at the fabric I chose. What do y'all think I should do for this? Share with us your finished projects. And that way it's more of a community-based element that I think so many of us are missing these days, right? We don't have sewing retreats right now, no quilting retreats. And so I think this is gonna be super duper fun. All right, um, let's see. Um, someone's asking, do I have to burn off the ends of the webbing so it doesn't fray? So that's a great question. If it's cotton webbing, you're not going to burn anything off because it's just, it's not going to melt, right? Because it's not a synthetic. So if you're using the nylon webbing and the polypropylene, yes, when you cut, you can just hit it with a lighter and it'll melt and seal the ends in place. If it is a cotton webbing, then based on, typically, based on how it's inserted into the bag, you usually will have that raw edge inside a seam somewhere, so you don't really need to do anything with it because it'll be caught in the seam and then it won't fray. Hopefully that makes sense. All right, so thank you everybody for tuning in. That's right, Maureen, go ahead and give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Share it with your friends if you're on Facebook and you have friends that like to do crafts and make handbags. They might find it useful and pick up a couple tips and tricks from today's session. And then I will be back on Friday night at 7 p.m., to close out the bag club so y'all have until then to join and then i'm gonna have a big reveal because we are gonna kick it off or like close it up with a huge what i think is a pretty huge giveaway prize and so you'll definitely want to tune in to find out exactly what that is so i will see y'all friday at 7 p.m enjoy the rest of your week and happy sewing everybody bye and make handbags they might find it useful and pick up a couple tips and tricks from today's session and then i will be back on friday night at 7 p.m to close out the bag club so y'all have until then to join and then i'm gonna have a big reveal because we are gonna kick it off or like close it up with a huge what i think is a pretty huge giveaway prize and so you'll definitely want to tune in to